Greetings my friends, how are you doing? This is Zeb from Zed Outdoors and I hope you're having an awesome day. So today I'm spending time with a good buddy of mine, Paul Adamson. Paul, how are you doing? I'm doing all right, yeah. Right, so this is part two of a two-part spoon carving series I am filming with Paul. Now in the previous video, what we covered was Paul's entire process from start to finish on how to carve an eating spoon. It was a very in-depth look in the entire process, taking a raw piece of wood to the finished product. Now this is part two in that series. And in this video, we're gonna look at Paul's process for production spoon carving, which is essentially taking all the principles from the previous video and streamlining it so you're able to carve a spoon a lot quicker um, in a lot less time, still using the same principles. Now, just to kind of touch on briefly, Paul, um, in terms of the production spoon carving and what we're gonna cover in this particular video, what kind of circumstances is this useful for? You were talking about your own experiences, mm. um, making spoons at live events and fairs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so would you say is that kind of environment this is suitable for? That's where it came into practice for me. So. I got to a stage after a couple of years of spoon carving where I could make them to a reasonable standard quite quickly, one spoon. And then I got really interested in spoon shapes and trying to nail down what was a good teaspoon, what was a good cooking spoon, and, um, and sticking to those shapes. And then the next thing to do was to work out how to make them faster. And that's what we'll talk about later in depth. But um, this all happened because of shows. So I was doing live Cook, um, spoon carving demonstration, not cooks as, uh, spoon carving demonstrations uh, in front of big audiences and it was it was really good fun, I used to love it. So initially it started out, I don't know, once an hour, you, the message will go out, Paul's going to do a demonstration, you put it on a chalkboard and, um, and it was all good fun and there'd probably only be three or four demonstrations like that. And then I realised once the crowd went, I was bored, so mm. I'd just do another one and, right. and I'd do 15 a day make a spoon from start to finish. And before you know it, you've got bagfuls of these things, half finished, and you have to do something with it. And I thought, how much faster could it be if I didn't have to talk and I didn't have an audience and it was just me and the garden? And yeah, it went really fast. So that's how I started to go. I had to slow myself down a bit. It was ridiculous. I, I was running out of wood and right. you know, the tools were getting <laughs> blunt and, and it was, I wasn't seeing anybody or going anywhere or doing anything except making spoons. So um, yeah, it, I learned a lot doing it. It wasn't just for fun. And it meant when I attended a show, I had 40, 50 spoons for sale and it didn't matter if I sold half of them. I could go to somewhere else the next day or stay there for two days and still be able to offer them for sale to the public. And it was ironic that the spoons I was making the week before were the ones on display for sale. Right. And it was because of making them quickly, having to really to entertain the audience so they can see what you guys have seen in like the last one, like an hour or something, shrink that down into 10 minutes, get them rather really engaged and, and, and excited before they move on to the next store, because there might be 100 stalls to look at. Or it might be a market where everyone's not really come to see someone like me and I just happen to be there. And then they go, what's all this about? Most people are a bit adversarial, but not really interested. So if I can get them one over even faster, that, that's the thing to do. And it makes me make more spoons. So yeah, it's all good fun. But this is a topic I've not covered before and I've been very eager for quite some time. With the growing popularity of spoon carving, like Paul's just outlined, a typical spoon could take quite a bit of time to carve. But with more and more spoon carvers demoing at events or gatherings or whatnot, um, in order to, to meet, quote unquote, the demand of a lot of kind of public that are, that are attending that particular gathering or event, um, being able to like to streamline your process down to something a lot quicker, mm. still churning out a, a perfectly yeah, fine, perfectly functional fine. spoon, Just but doing shape. it in a lot less time and, yeah. and the, uh, making things a lot more efficient. Yeah. Um, it just works out really well. So with your kind permission, Paul, we get cracking with this video. Let's do it. So awesome. So guys, without further ado, we're going to get started. So like I've already mentioned, it's ideal that you watch the previous video um, alongside this video if you haven't seen that already, because in that one, Paul breaks down the process in a lot more detail. So this is kind of shortening that to a, a much more stri a simpler streamlined process. So without further ado, I hope you enjoy the rest of this video where Paul Adamson is going to be demonstrating production spoon carving. Oh, 
Well Zed, here we go, some more spoons um, and some quite simple ones at the front. So these are the ones that are a bit quicker to make. And I've slightly slowed down the process by putting wiggly handles on on purpose but um, today we're going to make something a bit like this. And uh, they're just long handled teaspoons, perfect for coffee makers, uh, coffee chairs. There's an old one that's been used a lot at home. And uh, this one's just got a bit of milk paint on there, just to jazz it up a little bit. Just makes it that little bit more uh, refined, or lifts it a little bit from, from the plain ones, especially if you, you're making them quick. It's not a very complicated design, obviously. The, um, the things that make a, a spoon faster to make, uh, we touched on on the eating spoon. Trying to eliminate you know, tight areas, which are awkward to control. And you know, it's, there's lots of material to remove there, and you have to do most of it with an axe. Um, eliminating crank, so making straight spoons, teaspoons, cafetiers, cooking spoons, the straight. So that's even faster. Um, and smaller, so they're not particularly big, you know, they're, they're quite simple spoons. It's not, it's not like you're trying to make a serving spoon quickly. They, they really do take some thinking about. There's a lot of it's an eating spoon uh, scaled up, so there's a lot of uh, difficult areas, a lot of physical work to do to, to pull those off, to be honest. I, I don't tend to make a lot of those. People don't really want to buy them. Um, more of a commission thing. Ladles are really quite hard to make. They do take a long time. And, uh, but yeah, I think they're lovely though. Really, really like a ladle. I treat myself to a, a ladle making session uh, <laughs> once or twice a year when I get some nice bent branches. Um, yeah, so we'll crack into it. We're basically going to make one of these today and uh, I'll take you through the process and, and show you it in action rather than just in words. And just worth mentioning that in the previous video, uh, the main how to carve an eating spoon video, uh, we had a very detailed look at all the rest of the spoons. So do yeah. check that video out if you haven't done so already. And like you said, Paul, we we'll get straight into it. Let's do it. Okay, so we're um, we're back um, where we were at the eating spoon section. Really, we're preparing our wood. So I'm using um, some fairly large diameter sections of wood and I've already halved this side um, and I'm just going to keep halving all the sections until I've got a piece that's just high enough to make a spoon and this is called radial splitting and I find that I get far more spoons out of one piece of wood with less waste and you're preparing the two surfaces the upper and the lower surface certainly the upper one um, by accident, just by making these slices of, of wood. Because if you use a round branch, there's quite a lot of work to do to get a flat surface, unless you just get one automatically this way. So that's one way of speeding up the actual uh, time making the spoon. Um, the other thing is that radial split wood, I find, is easier to carve than round wood. It just seems to flow nicer with the knife. You can, you can almost cut up hill at times, it's just so forgiving. Uh, doing the bowls much easier going across that grain of radial split wood. And um, so that's the first stages of, um, of making them quickly. The other thing I like to do is to get a bag full of prepared billets ready before I do an event. And then I've just got to reach for one. And half the work's done for me. And then I can do all the, the obvious stuff, making it look like a spoon in front of people without all the all the faff. So we've already split it in half, so let's get it into quarters. Into eighths. Into sixteenths. And we could stop there. That's quite a quite a nice piece for a cooking spoon or one of the teaspoons we're going to make and I'll get I'll just grab a pencil and then we'll be able to to describe where we make it 
So this is quite thin, this, this piece here, and it's near the pith, so we want rid of that really. So that's the available timber we've got to work with just here. That's our, that's our thickness at the low end. And obviously we've got all of that there. So we've got one lovely flat surface ready to go. So normally it's just easier to make a rectangle. The other thing you can do is find the midpoint and think of it that way. Because if you're going to make the bowl of a cooking spoon, it's going to have its low point at this end anyway. So if you split that there, then you've done even more of the work in advance with just one blow of the axe. We're going to make a teaspoon, so if you're super clever, you could split that in half and make two. I don't want to risk it, so I'm going to give myself more material. And our, our teaspoon is going to be somewhere in that section, I would say. I could move it this way, but then I've got to remove all this wood with the axe. So if I can avoid that, I will do. Because we're not going to be splitting in a, a certain way so we know that the split's going to run straight, I know that I'm going to have to just waste off the sides with the axe probably. They won't, the splits probably will run out like this instead of going straight down. But we'll just see what happens. It's quite easy to carve this wood anyway. Okay, so let's, uh, let's see what we can create. Uh, somewhere around there. Oh, we're very lucky. Okay. Now then, I'll just swap axes. Just get that sharp corner off. And uh, we're ready to, to go, I think. I'm just going to tidy up this face because I think that's the more preferable one to draw the picture on. Yeah, that'll do. Okay, so I've got a very grotty looking template from an old child's uh, mat for putting hot plates onto tables. Actually really floppy, nice thick edge, so it's easy to get your pencil around there. Really good. Um, there's lots of things you make, make them from. Um, you can draw around a spoon, that's uh, how we used to do it to be honest. With this template we, we spoke off camera and um, you said you can very kindly make it available to download. Uh, yes, I've got um, a page just for templates on my website and uh, there's a couple on there that you can download. There's one for the eating spoon we did and there's one for a production spoon. So, um, so what I'll do guys, uh, just below this video I'm going to put a link and on that page uh, will be a template similar to what Paul is using here for you to download and use for your own production spoon carving. Yeah. All right, so it's, it's not particularly clever. There's nothing here. But coming down here, it's going to be super easy because that's a nice smooth line. It's not coming all the way in like this. Less work to do. And you don't need that to be removed. I do like to do very round, very tidy looking teaspoons from time to time but they take longer so you know I, I sort of get me head into that kind of uh, mentality beforehand and know it's going to take a little bit longer but it's not that much longer when you've done a few it, it, it's, it's quite easy to do really but for the purpose of the video we're trying to explain why some spoons are quicker to make and this is one of the big ones is having a handle that doesn't have sections that come quite as far in and a straight handle you know, it's, 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 it's just straight. It's not wobbling all over the place too much. It's not got a curve on it that's going to mess around with the way that the grain runs through the, through the wood. Less of the valley problems that we discussed on the eating spoon. Uh, and not too big. Anyway, well, um, there's hardly anything to remove there with the axe. It, you know, just that quick couple of blows, bit of a tidy up on that edge. Most of the work's already done. Okay, so let's just get into it. It's um, just a case of um, making some stop cuts. And then coming down from the top. I 
brushing those off. Trying to dodge the rain. If you were a beginner, I would recommend that you have some holding wood here so you don't draw your spoon right up against the edge, the end here. I'd, I'd move it down, have a longer piece of wood. Then you've got more to hold on to when you're coming up here like this. That's touchy, you know, so that's quite... Uh, it's, it's, I feel perfectly safe, but I wouldn't want you to do this if, you, if you're a bit new to the, to the craft. Okay, so that's the worst of that done. I know that the top surface is where I want it, so I'm going to turn it over now and just make the bottom edge a bit uh, thinner and more parallel. That's a lot more parallel than it was. And I'm just thinking about the thickness of the handle now. They don't want to be very thick. Okay, so that's pretty much there. Just a case of making the bowl um, a bit more pleasant. And then we're going to just um, put an angle on that wall there. So this is on the back of the bowl, yeah? Yeah, the back of the bowl. We're just trying to round it off, basically. And then we'll just make the end a bit thinner. Just looking. Quite often just checking. Easy to take too much off. It's quite hard to to draw the blows actually. It wants to come off so easily. And don't forget at the end of the day it's only got to stir a fluid. It's, uh, it's not a highly, you know, purposeful tool really. Just going to continue rounding that corner off a little bit. It's getting to the point now where the knife's actually going to be more convenient to do that, so that's what we'll do now. So I'm just going to use a standard um, Mora 106. Absolutely amazing knife. If, if ever you want to get into carving, don't be put off by the looks. It is far stronger than it looks and an absolute joy to use. And where would we be without them? So the first thing I do is to um, use the uh, pull grip. So instead of holding it like you would do in the forehand, where you would carve like this, what I like to do is to turn it all the way around, 180 degrees so it faces me, and I put my thumb over this side. I place the, um, the blade on the spoon, and I'm just going to push with these three fingers. Hold it with those two there. Gives you a lot of control. And there we go, we're down to final dimensions on that side. And flip it over and do the same. Okay. And then what I do is normally just we'll see how that ah, right, so the grain's gonna split funny there, so I'm gonna stop and then I come the other way. Always feel what the knife wants to do. So it wants to come down this way more so. So we're going to do that pull grip again. But I'm actually releasing from the fingers at points. Or you can walk your fingers down like this. Okay. Bit of a thumb push just in there just to 
make that a bit sweeter. Okay, so down this side again. Let's see how this goes with a chest lever, it might be a bit aggressive. No, that's alright. So there's actually quite a few grips there that you can use just for doing something as simple as that. So that's got these two sides pretty much sorted. I knew the top one was alright anyway. Bottom one's not too far off because we did that little bit of forehand action. That'll probably do. So it's a square almost. I'll make it look more oh, wrong way. Um, bit nicer. So yeah, something a bit like that. And then I like to take the corners off all the way down and make it an octagonal spoon like the old medieval ones. And it just feels a bit nicer to use and it's kind of like a cheats way, a carving way of making a round handle, you know, like a dowel that isn't round but effectively it is. It's just that you've got eight facets that cause that to feel rounded. Um, so that's quite a nice thing to do but I know that's an easy thing to do and we'll do that later. So the most important thing now is just to make sure all this is nice and sweet and finished. So I normally just look straight down on the top and I'll work around this, this edge first and I don't worry about the back yet. I know the material's there to do what I need to do, so what shall I do? So I'll do this first. So some grips work better than others. At the minute this is feeling like the one I need to use. I'm gonna do that. I'm gonna do this one. Once I've got around to the end of that the highest spot, if you like, of that line, I know that I can come down that way with just a thumb push. So we were doing the assisted grip there with just one finger. I'll get right to the top of that hill and I come back down the other side with a thumb push. When I get nearly there, I stop because I once had an injury where I left my finger in the way. So I know not to do that anymore. So what I do is I turn that around every time, turn the knife around and do a potato peeler grip. It's super safe, as long as your thumb's miles out of the way, which it is. Turn it around again, come this way. Thumb push. Knowing I'm gonna skip off and probably cut myself, stop. Do that. So it's just more of that over and over again, basically. That looks a bit, Naff, I'm going to come in there a bit more. Right, thin this bit now. Do the back of the bowl, with thumb pushes mainly. Be careful you don't make this too thin though, this, this side wall. It's very easy to. You're almost trying to prevent it from cutting in in a way when you get this close to the end. So it's just a gradual taper if you like, curve going from fat to thin. Leave a little bit of thickness at the end. If you're even too thin, they sort of get all curled up and mushy after a, about a year. Especially if you use them in for, for other things like, um, I often use them for um, scraping the bottom of a pan or something like that, just to clean it. And yeah, you can get a bit furry if you're not careful. Right about there, and that. Okay, so that's uh, starting to look something like. I mean, I could sit there and make it even better, but I think that's, that's going to serve the, the purposes. There's a little bit of a, I don't know if you can see, there's a little bit lower there and a bit higher there. So I'll just tidy that up quick before I do the bowl. Uh, that's felt wrong that did with the grain, so I'm going to come this way. Yeah, 
that's feeling good. That's all ready to go now for the for bowl making. But before I do that, I like to just finish the handle. So this is where you can you can start messing around if you want to make it look wonky. I think just for speed I'll keep it straight though. Okay, so start the bevels. So this is just basically taking the corners off. Yes. The edges. Yep. Yeah, it just it just makes them feel nicer when you're holding on to them. And um, it strengthens the edges of the bowl. Um, what I can do with the handle though is go a little bit more deeper with those, uh, make the facets a bit, a bit wider if you like. Bit of a grain change there, splitting out. And then it's moving away from just a, a square shaped handle to something a bit, a bit more pleasant. And when you paint them they look great because you've got all these lovely long facets with corners on that you can, um, which don't tend to take the paint as well. And the, sh the light shines differently on the edges so you, you can see that it's a handmade, well you can see that it's got um, tool marks shall we say, because some handmade things don't, don't, don't look like that you know. See, that's going too much, too aggressive, so I'm going to come around and tackle it the other direction. Yes, there's a grain change there. It's a bit weird. Right in the middle of the spoon and all. So what I'll do is just shave away thinner bits until I get down to the bottom of where that last cut was. Then it should just come off like that. And I'll come the other way to... There we go. That's got control of it now. back to that. That's probably going to lift when it dries. We can just nip that off there. Okay. I'm probably taking too long but you know quite enjoying it to be honest. <laughs> okay so ready for hollowing. Uh, we'll do something interesting at the end though. I like to put some sort of an angle. Um, probably go. Which way should I go? Yeah, I'll go this way. So take more off on on this side here. Then put a bevel on. So again, it's a production spoon. So I'm not going to spend too long doing a finial. Just going to have a simple angled cut, and then some neat little chamfer things. That'll do. So hollowing time. So we're just going to just hollow this out now. Really, you should have a smaller um, sort of with a hook knife than this, and, and, a, and a tighter curve. Um, but if I, if I use this bit here, it normally does a, a reasonable job. It just feels a little bit um, like the inappropriate tool, but it, it, it's not too bad. It's only got to stir coffee at the end of the day. So Paul, yep. to wrap up, talking about drying, uh, when it comes to production spoons, do yep. you, what do you do about that? Uh, drying something as, as thin as this, I mean I could, I could refine it a bit more, 
Um, it'll be dry within a day or two, just left on the side somewhere in the house. Um, you can you can be quite um, radical and just put them somewhere. I put them in the oven sometimes. Just I just put loads of them on a tray in the oven, fairly low. Um, you know, 100 degrees or something like that, but um, that can really speed up the drying if you, if you want to get them ready for the next day, oh, well, the next week. Um, and then it's just a case of plonking some oil on there. Um, a good quality cooking oil, other than olive oil, is normally all that's needed. Um, you want an oil that cures, and the curing oils are typically, uh, from the supermarket anyway, are walnut oil, grapeseed oil, and um, some of the cold pressed flaxseed, not flaxseed, um, oil seed rape oils, they're quite good. If you want a faster drying time, then it's the linseed oils, often called flaxseed oil, and it's the food grade versions that you want. And there's very, various different ones, but they all do a similar job, and a couple of weeks on a spoon like this, a thin layer would, would be more than you needed, really, to say that it's cured and done. So, um, yeah, that's it really. So just one final thing then. So let's say now someone's dealing with the public, um, you know, you're obviously they're doing the production spoon carving technique that you just outlined. Yeah. What would you typically recommend that people have the semi, the, the kind of the, the previously dried and oil spoons ready to sell? Um, and then the ones you're actually demoing, um, you actually kind of keep to one side, if that makes sense. So, yeah, so what I would do is I'd, I'd probably finish, it's not brilliant this, um, it's a bit thick and chunky around the edge, so I'd probably spend another minute or two on this at home when it's dry, it's not, it's not dry now. Um, paint them, oil them, cure them and get them ready for the next show. Um, and then when I'm at the show I just make sure that I've got plenty of, of these ready to go. And then I just... Um, do what you've seen basically in front of the public so and in terms of the spoons that you sell they're the ones that you previously carved they're often the ones from the week before yeah right okay yeah and um, it's normally these that sell um cooking spoons simple spoons because they're cheaper you know and, and it, uh, most people don't really know what all this is about and it's a nice gateway into green woodworking and thinking about purchasing something a bit larger that took longer to make um, such as cooksers or bowls or larger serving spoons and they often come back um, it might be the next year that the, 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 this festival comes around it might just be a market where you're there the next week and someone says, oh, that, that teaspoon off you, it's brilliant, I love it, it's great, you know, best five pound ever spent. And they'll go, oh, what else have you got? Oh, well, I've got these, oh yeah, well, then they're getting into it and they know how they're made, they know that they're durable and strong and that they work and that they can't buy one from the supermarket, they can't buy these, they just don't make them. So um, it's a unique product in a way and it's all sustainable and I chat to people about where I get the wood from because it's all just from thinnings from woodland which is only there to benefit the woodland, the, the thinning work. So uh, it's just uh, all very pleasant for everyone, that, that myself and the, and the customer combined, so. So there you have it, my friends. That's a wrap for this video. Paul, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you for coming. This is a very specific type of spoon carving that's not really been covered online, has it? I uh, don't think a, so. A huge amount. So yeah. I'm really honored that you've kind of taken the time to show me. That's it's right, going to benefit a lot of the spoon carvers that are out there that are watching. So just doing a final recap, um, as I mentioned, this is a two part two of a two part spoon carving series I filmed with Paul. The previous video is a much more refined eating spoon, takes a lot longer, a lot more refinement, a lot more in the process. And once again, if you haven't seen that already, I would highly recommend you do so. Link to that will be down below. Secondly, there'll be a link below to a page on Paul's website. On that page, Paul has very kindly put up a template for the very spoon that you've seen in this video that you can download and use for yourself. And also, if he has them available, there's the op uh, possibility as well of purchasing one of the spoons that Paul's obviously carved in this video or something very similar. What I'm also gonna do is put a link below to Paul's Instagram. 
Paul is very active on his Instagram profile. You can see the myriad of things that he gets up to. He's a renowned teacher here in the UK, he teaches up and down the country, spoon carving, cooks are carving, birch bark craft, etc. So you can see the myriad of things that he gets up to. Also, one thing I actually forgot to mention, when you go to his website, may I highly recommend that you join his email list. On his email newsletter, what he does, he keeps you up to date of all the various things he gets up to throughout the UK, where he's going to be teaching, what he's going to be teaching, as well as the things that he's getting up to himself, that he's also crafting and making himself. Uh, Paul's one of the most talented guys I know, and I really do mean that in a variety of disciplines. So it's always great to see what he gets up to via his Instagram and also his email newsletter. So Paul, a sincere thank you once thank again. You, yeah. So guys, hope you enjoyed this video. And as always, I hope whatever you're doing, you have a blessed day, a blessed week ahead. From Paul Adamson and myself, Zell Outdoors, peace out.